this in the here yeah we we want to spend the time here and then i have to run to the or um with with bobby in the next uh uh, 45 minutes to an hour so if you don't mind i will give my lecture and answer a few questions and then i'll have to excuse myself so i'm really delighted to be here to talk to you a bit about a real uh, serendipitous story you know this is it came out of nowhere uh, it is such a wonderful story of uh, a transformative class of agents that professor brownwald has called the statins of the 21st century. So this is a class of medication that whether you're a cardiac surgeon or whether you're a vascular surgeon, cardiologist, family doctor, for that matter, any kind of doctor uh, you should know about because uh, their history is short. Uh, it's only been about seven or eight years or actually seven years since the first clinical trial reported. But this is a class of medication that has really transformed cardiovascular and renal protection. And I'm going to tell you the story of the SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, we're not going to talk about diabetes because that's where the field started. But I'm just going to remind you that SGLT2 inhibitors first were introduced as medications to lower glucose. And the way they work is that they inhibit SGLT2 receptors in the proximal tubule. And by doing that, as you all know, the majority of glucose is absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Um, and when you inhibit uh, SGLT2 uh, receptors in the proximal convoluted tubule, you would call, cause glucose to be excreted. And that was the underlying mechanism that people were interested in is another novel mechanism of lowering sugar in people with diabetes could be inhibiting SGLT2 uh, in the kidney. And um, the drugs were tested initially and shown to be efficacious in terms of lowering uh, glucose. But then the FDA in 2008 said that drugs that lower glucose should have trials to demonstrate cardiovascular safety and or efficacy. And in this regard, four diabetes trials were done. Empareg outcome that Professor Bernie Zinman led from Mount Sinai Hospital at the University of Toronto. 100% of these patients had cardiovascular disease or, you know, ASCVD or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. The Virtus trial also enrolled people with diabetes with cardiovascular disease. The CANVAS trial enrolled people with and without uh, cardiovascular disease but had diabetes. And then the DECLARE trial enrolled people uh, primarily uh, who actually had diabetes but had not yet had established cardiovascular disease. So primary prevention patients were 60% of the cohort. And resultantly, we've actually been able to generate a huge amount of data around SGLT2 inhibitors in people with diabetes in primary and secondary prevention uh, with GFRs, you know, in some cases above 60 and in some cases above 30. And uh, as again, you uh, are all aware and for our trainees on the line that SGLT2 inhibitors are now featured in every diabetes guideline for cardiorenal protection in people with or without established cardiovascular disease. So I know we're gonna talk about heart failure, but cardiovascular surgeons see a lot of people with diabetes who have, you know, a history of ASCVD, and you wonder what should the therapies be in those patients. They should be either SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists. So cumulatively, what did we learn in diabetes? We learned that uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in people with diabetes, with or without established cardiovascular disease, had about a 10% effect to reduce major adverse cardiovascular events. They're not really uh, medications that have a profound impact on atherosclerotic events. You know, statins, as for example, are really profound at reducing atherosclerotic events. And so are, you know, aspirin and dual antiplatelet therapy with P2Y12 inhibitors or low-dose rivaroxaban or other kinds of strategies really work in that regard. But 
what was really uh, striking was this observation that this was not, these were not heart failure patients at all. These were people with diabetes. Many of them were people with diabetes who had had a prior history of cabbage, for example. And we reported that data from the Empereg outcome trial showing that people with diabetes who had had a prior history of cabbage had a profound benefit of empagliflozin, in the SGLT2 inhibitor studied in the Empereg outcome trial. Um, but what was found is that all of these trials had a very consistent and profound benefit to prevent heart failure hospitalizations. So in people with diabetes who did not have heart failure at baseline, these medications could cut the risk of developing new heart failure by close to 30%. Uh, and, you know, that was seen in people with or without established cardiovascular disease. Now, that was a pretty surprising observation uh, in terms of prevention of heart failure. But what was equally compelling was the really surprising results on kidney protection. And when you look at hard renal outcomes, how do you define hard renal outcomes? Doubling of serum creatinine, a sustained decline in EGFR, renal death, need for renal replacement therapy, for example. There was a close to 40% reduction in the renal outcomes in people with diabetes. And this was all on top of standard of care. So I'm sure all of you are aware that really the signature of SGLT2 inhibitors are really prevention and treatment of heart failure, prevention and treatment of renal disease. So when, when these data came to bear, uh, there were outstanding questions. And the first question was, okay, we learned that you can prevent heart failure in people with diabetes, which we have never been able to do with any other strategy. You know, DPP-4 inhibitors are neutral, metformin is neutral, sulfonylureas is controversial, what they do to heart failure. Uh, and some DPP-4 inhibitors, such as saxagliptin, increase rates of heart failure. Insulin goes both ways. It increases rates of heart failure or is neutral. So drugs that lower glucose have never been shown, had never been shown to prevent heart failure. So this was completely new. But the question that was then uh, raised was, can these drugs actually be used in the treatment of established heart failure? You know, patients who have heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction on top of ACE, ARB, ARNI, MRA, beta blocker, you know, therapies that were at that point standard of care, can these drugs be used to treat established heart failure? And the second question was, are these benefits exclusive to people with diabetes or are they going to be seen in all comers with and without diabetes? This is a pretty bold question to ask that a drug that actually primarily at that point we thought works through causing glucosuria. Uh, why would it actually cause glucosuria in a patient without diabetes and why would it work in someone without diabetes? So this was an entirely novel question uh, that we set out to answer. So we embarked on, you know, a series of trials. And the three uh, trials shown here are the ones I'm going to discuss first, and then I'm going to discuss Emperor Preserved. Uh, I've been involved in all of the trials in the leadership role. Uh, we uh, first did the DAPA-HF trial, which was with dapagliflozin in ambulatory patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction. Um, on top of standard of care. And then the emperor reduced trial, also looking at patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction uh, with slightly more advanced heart failure with uh, higher NT pro BNP and poorer LV function. And then we did a trial of another SGLT2, SGLT1 inhibitor asking the question, well, what if you started these therapies in hospital or within a day or two of discharge in the context of someone who got admitted with a worsening heart failure admission. After they've been stabilized, can you give these drugs in hospital? And then we've done a trial in patients with HEF-PEF that we've reported. So 
The DAPA HF trial was the first trial that we reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, and that was a trial looking at 4,744 patients uh, with uh, or without diabetes who had heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction. 50% had diabetes, 50% did not have diabetes. And uh, these were patients who were treated really well with background therapy, and we found a 26% highly statistically significant benefit of dapagliflozin and SGLT2 inhibitor on top of standard of care in patients with HEFREF for the primary outcome of CV death and a uh, heart failure hospitalization. I think which what was really transformative for the field was that on top of standard of care, this therapy was associated with a significant 18% reduction in cardiovascular death. So it's not only non-fatal events, but fatal events that were also being prevented with this therapy. In addition, all-cause mortality was reduced by 17%, and the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval in this case was also below one. So then the second hypothesis that we put forward, and uh, Mark Petri uh, and I, uh, actually led this analysis published in JAMA was the question uh, of whether these drugs are efficacious in people without diabetes. I think this was really uh, a very interesting and paradigm shifting observation because suddenly drugs for diabetes uh, crossed over to everybody with and without diabetes who had HEFREF. And what we found was that whether people had diabetes or whether they did not have diabetes, it made absolutely no difference. The hazard ratio was identical. There was no interaction per se. And we also looked at this from a continuous analysis looking at hemoglobin A1C, that if the hemoglobin A1C was five or six or seven or 12, whether you had diabetes or prediabetes or were normal glycemic or had hyperglycemia, the benefit of dapagliflozin was entirely consistent across the entire range of glycemic uh, or A1C studied for both the primary endpoint and cardiovascular death. So I think this was really uh, critical. We then asked the question as to whether these therapies were beneficial on top of background therapy. What's the point of bringing forward a new therapy if the therapy is not efficacious in a complementary way on top of other established therapies. And we know that in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, we have made tremendous progress pharmacologically with ACE inhibitors and ARBs and ARNIs and beta blockers and MRA, the, the sort of cornerstones of therapy. And you can see that the benefit is entirely consistent in those on these background therapies. We uh, have also then looked at a broader composite outcome that included outpatient worsening of heart failure. And what do we mean by that is that patients not admitted to hospital, but patients in whom physicians thought intensification of diuretics in an outpatient setting or intensification of heart failure therapies was required. There is no doubt that that is a highly uh, persuasive result with many zeros in the p-value as you can see here. Now, one of the intriguing analyses that we published last year in diabetes care was whether these drugs could prevent new diabetes in patients with HEFREF who did not have diabetes at baseline. And we found a 32% reduction in new diabetes in patients with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction who did not have diabetes at baseline. So prevention of diabetes is important uh, and it's yet another reason why these therapies should be considered in that context. Now, how quickly are these benefits observed? And this has been, again, one of the really wonderful observations. We've just published these data in JAMA Cardiology, actually uh, towards the end of last year. And what we found was that if you look at the first 100 days, by day 28, the p-value for the primary outcome achieves statistical significance. So it's not like you've got to wait years or months for the 
uh, benefit to be accrued, you see these benefits very soon after initiation of treatment. Now, what about duration of heart failure? Some have said, well, should you wait for someone to have heart failure for five years or two years or three years, or does it work in someone with you know, de novo uh, heart failure that's a first presentation of HEFREF? Again, it doesn't matter. It works across every type of HEFREF. And we've just published recently that irrespective of the etiology of HEFREF, whether that HEFREF is because of an ischemic etiology or a non-ischemic etiology, uh, the benefits are seen in a very consistent fashion for the primary outcome and all of the individual components of the primary outcome. So it is agnostic to etiology when it comes to heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. So, um, you know, it was quite uh, wonderful that uh, I was able to join this this great team of, uh, of, uh, of real mavens in the field, Professor Deepak Bat and Professor Eugene Brownwald from Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School, where we reminded uh, you know, readers of how important this trial really is uh, or was in the war against heart failure. And it really ushered in a new way of thinking about heart failure therapies. Um, I was on the steering committee of this other trial as well called the Emperor uh, Reduced Trial in which we uh, were evaluating uh, the effects of empagliflozin in HEFREF, another SGLT2 inhibitor. Now the trial has similarities to DAPA-HF but has some differences. We enrolled more advanced patients with HEFREF, in this case patients with more advanced LV dysfunction, much higher baseline NT pro BNP. And we found really consistent benefits of empagliflozin on the primary outcome of CV death and heart failure hospitalizations. As you can see here, highly persuasive p-value and NT of only 19 in this population with the first statistical significance for the primary outcome noted at 12 days after treatment initiation. The Second outcome of the trial was total hospitalizations for heart failure, first and recurrent, and that too was reduced by 30% with empagliflozin on top of standard of care. Uh, we also demonstrated that empagliflozin reduced total hospitalizations requiring IV vasopressor or positive inotropic drugs. So not only was the sort of, you know, any kind of hospitalization, but serious hospitalizations that required patients to be treated with positive inotropes or IV vasopressors were also reduced by 33% with the, with the SGLT2 inhibitor empagliflozin. Heart failures, uh, heart failure requiring IC or CCU admission were reduced by 33%. And in keeping with what we know about the effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on renal protection, we found a significant uh, uh, protection in terms of the decline in the EGFR slope. So uh, in patients who are on the placebo group, uh, you know, the GFR declines at 2.3 mils per minute per year, and those who get empagliflozin really have no substantial decline in EGFR in the context of having heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction with or without diabetes in this regard. There was a 50% improvement in the composite clinical renal outcome in this population. You know, these are all transformative uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, results in terms of the magnitude of protection that you're seeing on top of standard of care. Now, with both of the trials, the tolerability of these therapies has been phenomenal. And I'm just going to share with you what we found in the EMPA-REG outcome trial, sorry, in the uh, uh, EMPA-REDUCE trial, where serious adverse events are, in fact, numerically fewer with empagliflozin compared to placebo. Um, serious adverse events related to a cardiac disorder or worsening renal failure are also fewer. You can see that volume depletion side effects that everybody is concerned about were really no different. 
Uh, there was no difference in hypotension or symptomatic hypotension, no excess in hypoglycemia. There is an increase in genital tract infections, which you all know is the most common uh, sort of side effect of these uh, therapies. And we saw about a 1.1% excess risk of genital tract infections. Uh, we did not find any ketoacidosis in the emperor reduced trial and in the DAPA-HF trial, there was some ketoacidosis, but it was numerically quite small and seen only in people with diabetes. Now, in the emperor reduced trial, we recruited people down to a GFR of 20 mils per minute. And what we have found is that there is efficacy for the primary outcome as shown here, all uh, you know, uh, across all of the GFR categories, including patients with GFRs below 30. So you may be aware that in Canada, empagliflozin is approved in the treatment uh, of diabetic patients who have high glucose or cardiovascular risk down to a GFR of 30 mils per minute. But if patients have HEFREF, with or without diabetes, you can use the medication down to a GFR of 20 mils per minute in keeping with the inclusion criteria of the trial. Now, we also published uh, the, uh, this is a circulation revision. It's actually not there. It's currently not published yet. Um, and this was looking at, uh, no, sorry, I apologize. I'm thinking of another paper. This was published recently in circulation, and that is looking at the efficacy of empagliflozin in people with and without diabetes, just like we found in the DAPA-HF trial. Likewise, we found in the emperor reduced trial, no interaction by A1C at baseline. Now, I was just talking uh, to your colleagues prior to getting started that ARNIs are really important medications in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, and therefore demonstrating the efficacy of SGLT2 inhibitors on top of angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibition is quite interesting and an important question. And as you can see here, people on an RNA versus not an RNA, there was really no difference whatsoever. What do I mean by that? That the benefits of empagliflozin are seen on top of, in addition to angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibition. So it's a complementary mechanism of action. Now, both of the trials have shown us convincingly that these drugs improve quality of life. And improving quality of life is really, really important in heart failure. Not only is it extending life, but making life more livable is quite important in HEFREF. And uh, one of the ways we test that is by looking at something called the KCCQ uh, clinical summary score, which is a patient reported and validated score that takes into account symptoms, congestion, you know, social functioning, and other parameters that are important to patients. And as you can see that by three months, there is a significant improvement in KCCQ clinical summary scores. And this is a uh, finding that has been consistently observed in all of the clinical trials. Improves morbidity, mortality, improves renal outcomes has benefits irrespective of diabetes status, improves quality of life, and does all of that uh, on top of standard of care therapy and without any excess in serious adverse events. And I think that's really uh, quite important. Now, what about objective NYHA class? Now, NYHA class is such a a lot of variability in how the data is collected and how patients report it. But nonetheless, in the context of a randomized trial, what is interesting is to note that is that by four weeks after treatment initiation, more patients uh, with HEFREF uh, reported an improvement in NYHA class and fewer patients reported a deterioration in NYHA class. So, uh, you know, it is certainly making people feel better uh, both in terms of patient reported outcomes, as well as in terms of objective evidence. So when we look at these two trials, there are more similarities than differences. Uh, 
The primary outcome is almost superimposable for the two trials, as are the individual components of the primary outcome. I actually don't think I've seen a clinical trial where the primary outcome is exactly the same in the two trials. So it's not about empagliflozin or dapagliflozin. It's about SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with HEFREF. And I think that's why we uh, have said uh, recently, you know, DAPA, HF, and Emperor Reduced are really, uh, you know, two tales, but they tell us one story, and that is that SGLT2 inhibitors have come of age in the treatment of HEFREF. So our foundational therapy in HEFREF that used to be ACE MRA beta blocker is really undergoing quite a lot of a sort of revolution now, if I may. And we now not only think about these as being important therapies, but one thing I hope uh, this diagram uh, conveys to, to everyone is that we have put these at a sort of a horizontal integration. It's not that you start with an ACE, then you go to a beta blocker, then you go to an MRA, and then you go to switch to an RNA, or then you go to dapagliflozin. In the past, what we've done is we have sequentially uh, and in a vertical fashion followed uh, the trials and their uh, sort of uh, chronology of reporting. And what we are now advocating for is that these are distinct uh, chemotherapies for heart failure, if I may, and they should all be on the table and it should be more of a horizontal integration as opposed to a vertical sequential in, uh, you know, integration that often leads to inertia and does not lead to you know, appropriate therapies in this population. So DAPA and EMPA really have entered the world as treatments for HEF-REF. So the question is, how do these drugs work? And in addition to you know, great uh, sort of interest in the clinical trials that I've reported to you thus far, our group has had a real dominant interest in understanding the mechanisms, both at the bed bedside as well as at the bench. And there are several mechanisms that have been put forward, many of which we have investigated uh, primarily in our group. And these can be divided into the so-called direct effects of SGLT2 inhibitors on the myocardium and the so-called indirect effects or systemic effects of SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and the indirect effects are that they improve renal function and through improving renal function can improve heart failure outcomes. They improve uh, regenerative cell exhaustion in the bone marrow uh, and therefore improve provascular progenitor cell function. We've shown that these drugs increase erythropoietin production and through improving EPO release can increase myocardial oxygen delivery. They reduce sympathetic nervous system activity and renal sympathetic afferent tone and quite interestingly, uh, they seem to have a really important effect at improving myocardial energetics. And they do that by changing the flux of fatty acid oxidation and ketone oxidation, which may uh, really provide the myocardium with a cheaper fuel supply, if I may. Uh, you know, as you know, the heart can use really any fuel, uh, but each fuel comes at a different cost. Uh, so by, you know, providing a substrate such as ketones, uh, which are more energy efficient, it has been suggested that these drugs can improve myocardial energetics. Now, what about direct myocardial effects? And that too has gained some traction that these drugs may interact with the sodium hydrogen exchanger at the level of the myocardium, inhibit CAM kinase 2 delta, preventing, you know, abnormal intracellular calcium build up, uh, have effects on myocardial autophagy and mitophagy, and also reduce the NLRP3 inflammasome, all of which may contribute to the benefits in heart failure. Now, we led a trial called EMPA Heart, uh, part of the CardioLink platform that, that I'm uh, a co-chair of, in which we did a randomized trial in patients with diabetes and vascular disease. And uh, the primary outcome was a change in left ventricular mass index by cardiac MR. Um, and we demonstrated that over six months, these drugs uh, 
promote cardiac reverse remodeling. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the key mechanisms through how these drugs work, uh, at least in our opinion, is this early rise in erythropoietin that is seen. And, and this increase in EPO may actually serve many functions in addition to increasing oxygen delivery and in energy and oxygen starved heart may also have effects on the bone marrow circulating progenitor cells and other vascular protective mechanisms. Well, that was the story of uh, emperor reduced in DAPA HF. And then we asked the question, as I mentioned earlier, what about if we use these drugs in worsening heart failure in hospital? And uh, we did a trial called Soloist uh, with sotagliflozin, which is an SGLT2, SGLT1 inhibitor, where we gave patients who had come into hospital with a worsening heart failure admission, not in the throes of a acute event, but after they were stabilized and prior to discharge or a day or two after discharge. And we found a 33% reduction in total CV death, heart failure and urgent heart failure visits. And these were people with or without heart failure with a reduced or preserved ejection, ejection fraction, highly persuasive p-value treatment patient years to avoid one event was only four. So with that in mind, uh, Professor McMurray and Professor Packer really uh, came out with a series of uh, very, very provocative and interesting papers asking the question uh, or really questioning the wisdom behind the conventional sequencing of these drugs, which only uh, propagate inertia. And we know that triple therapy, which saves lives, uh, is not used widely. So this proposed new scheme or sequence was put on the table for patients with de novo heart failure, that why not start with a beta blocker and an SGLT2 inhibitor? Beta blockers are known to reduce sudden death most profoundly, and SGLT2 inhibitors reduce mortality. They improve renal function and are hemodynamically you know, quite, quite favorable. They don't cause hyperkalemia. They don't cause hyponatremia. They don't cause hypoglycemia. Maybe that's a really good combination to start is step one, followed by an ARNI, followed by an MRA. I'm less fussed about what you choose as first, second, third, or fourth, as long as the goal is to try to achieve four drugs within four weeks in most patients. This sentiment is now echoed in the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines. These are the latest CCS heart failure guidelines and I'm sure our trainees who are studying for their exams know this quite well, that we no longer talk about start with an ACE and beta blocker, and then up titrate the dose of an ACE, then switch to an RNA, then up titrate the dose of beta blocker, then add an MRA. We talk about initiate standard therapies in HEFREF. You know, as they say, you... Uh, I love my children equally, right? There's one is not better or superior or comes ahead of the other. They're all standard therapies. You all, they're all at the equal footing and all of them need to be initiated as step one in a patient with heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction. Now I understand that there's some patients that are going to be harder to initiate one over the other and no one is advocating for giving four drugs the first time you see the patient. But I guess the thought is that in short order, within two to four weeks, trying to get these patients on these life-saving therapies and not getting too fussed about maximizing the dose of each therapy, getting them on a low dose of what they can tolerate uh, and then fine tuning the dose after the four pillars of therapy have been initiated. So in the last five minutes or so, I'd like to just talk about the other face of heart failure, uh, and that is the 50% other face, or, and that is HEF-PEF, uh, for which we have had no therapies. No clinical trial has met its primary outcome in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, in this circulation white paper from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood, Blood Institute, you can see that HEFPEF is a critical public health problem. And due to the lack of any effective treatment, HEFPEF is actually considered one of the greatest unmet needs in cardiology today. And that's an excerpt from this white paper. We know that uh, it's a very heterogeneous population. And 
we rolled the dice and published these data recently in the New England Journal, and that was the trial of Emperor Preserved. Uh, we took patients with an ejection fraction of over 40% who had documented heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, treated them with empagliflozin 10 milligrams versus placebo, and demonstrated unequivocally a 21% benefit on the primary outcome of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization in this population of patients with HEFPEF. The first trial to have met its primary outcome uh, in HEFPEF and uh, really ushers in a new way of thinking about SGLT2 inhibitors in heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. So um, I really think now is, uh, you know, SGLT2 inhibitors are agnostic to ejection fraction. If you have a patient who has heart failure and has symptomatic heart failure, whether their EF is 35% or 50%, it doesn't matter that they derive benefit on the primary outcome of CV death or heart failure and all of the other individual components listed here consistently irrespective of ejection fraction. Now, there is some controversy around people with EFs of over 65 that I won't get into today, uh, but for the doctor in the trenches, the message is clear. These are therapies for heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or a preserved ejection fraction. And we will be reporting the results of the dapagliflozin HEFPEF trial at the European Society of Cardiology meeting within the next few months. We're still all blinded. And I, I do expect that this trial will further clarify and advance the field in this regard. So um, the title that I was given today really is one that Professor McMurray from Glasgow and I uh, used in an editorial that we wrote in circulation recounting how um, you know uh, surprising uh, this class of agents has been. No one would have predicted that SGLT2 inhibitors would emerge as you know, drugs to treat diabetes, but to prevent heart failure, prevent renal disease, prevent and treat HEFREF and HEFPEF and do that safely uh, and uh, do that within such a short time frame. You know, it's only been six and a half or seven years when the first SGLT2 inhibitor cardiovascular outcome trial was reported. Actually, it's been six years. And since then, we've seen this field really really uh, explode and transform guidelines and patient care throughout the world. Now, when it comes to heart failure, I know you're, you're starting your heart failure uh, uh, lecture series. You know, most of us are, you know, uh, invested here at the end of the spectrum of treating heart failure, treating advanced heart failure, mechanical support, transplant. Um, but uh, as they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We know that at least in people with diabetes, SGLT2 inhibitors can prevent heart failure development by 30 to 40%. And now we know that that efficacy is seen across the spectrum and includes people who have established heart failure. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop. I hope uh, uh, I've left a few minutes for questions and really thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. So much for that, Dr. Verma. That was absolutely fantastic and exactly what we were hoping for. Um, we'll get started. Rashmi has a question and has her hand up, so I'll let her do it. Yeah, sure. Hello, Dr. Verma. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. I mean, I've been <laughs> uh, seeing all sorts of emails from you about AI. and. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, but actually, maybe I should start off by saying, please consider <laughs> the emails that we have been sending and in the upcoming CSCS meeting. But nonetheless, We're I actually- do that for sure, 100%. Awesome, awesome. I'd love to hear from you about it. Um, I actually really echo uh, Saurabh's comment about, that was actually so excellent. Like, I've been studying for my exam and I feel like I mean, it's so impressive. You, you guys have basically found a new class of drugs, right? So it's, it could be like, you know how ACE inhibitors to RNAs, like I feel like an RNA is like a, a step up on the ACE inhibitor, you know, it's an ACE inhibitor plus. I feel like what you have created probably is like a, is a, is a whole class, which is really, really fascinating. What I wonder though, is that as I follow through the guidelines, I realize like the cardiorenal axis and like the value of the, the impact of it is like profound, right? Mm 
And a lot of these drugs are <clears throat> basically like not available to patients with renal dysfunction. You're basically left with like beta blockers for patients who have bad renal dysfunction. So it's like, what do we do for those patients? I feel yeah. like there's a real gap there. Yeah, it's a great, great question. And you're, you're absolutely right. I think this is a transformative class. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't have time to put in Professor Brownwall's slide um, uh, that said SGLT2 inhibitors are the statins of the 21st century. They're, they're, uh, uh, we're at the cusp of just like statins have transformed the world. Uh, these drugs are transforming the world. And, uh, you know, um, now the, the beauty here is that this is one class of agent that can be used, rush me, all the way down to a GFR of 20 mils per minute. And at down to 20 mils per minute, uh, there is great efficacy. There's no hyperkalemia. There's no hyponatremia. There's no acute kidney injury that is noted uh, that most of us worry about. And in fact, if anything, there's a 40 to 50% renal protection. I didn't get into the renal data today, but if you take someone with a GFR of, let's say, 45 who's spilling protein and you give them an SGLT2 inhibitor, whether they have diabetes or not, whether they have heart failure or not, you delay their need for dialysis by about 15 to 20 years. Wow. Right? So wow. It's, uh, it's pretty profound, right? So the Credence trial that Vlado Perkovich led uh, demonstrated that in albuminuric patients with, di with DKD, diabetic kidney disease, that you would actually prevent the need for dialysis by 15 to 20 years. So it's uh, as soon as you see a patient with uh, diabetes or ASCVD or heart failure whose renal function is deteriorating, I agree with you. That is the fuel that you know, really fuels heart failure, mm -hmm. the cardiorenal mm -hmm. renal axis, you need to intersect that axis because, yeah. uh, you know, the pump is not working and you can't get rid of toxins and that, yeah. that's, so it's maybe very simplistic, but that's what's happening. Totally. And you need to, you need to inter intersect that. So these are drugs that intersect that, that axis. And, uh, and I, I think it's, it's fair to, to expect that trainees in any specialty uh, are, are aware of the new guidelines, right? And the new guidelines in heart failure, uh, whether you're a primary care doctor or you do advanced transplant uh, heart failure, that these are, these are, this is a new pillar. Yeah. I, I asked as a, like a personal anecdote, my, so my mom's a type one diabetic and her endocrinologist is like up to date and he has put her on it. He put her on it 10 years ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like oh, he put wow. Her on yeah. A long time ago because he's although like, type one is one contraindication and should only be done by endocrinologists off label yeah right? yeah he totally did it off label but he like he spoke to me about it i was like a medical student then it, it, it was he he felt like he felt what we kind of the accumulating evidence he felt that a long time ago i mean i don't think my mom was like the best candidate maybe in the sense that she's otherwise very has good blood sugars like she's not one of those people who has crazy blood sugars i didn't think that she was like the target but i thought i mean he took her off of it after that, like after, like he's taken her off of it now, for example, but it's interesting. No, I, I, I agree with you. Well, thank awesome. you for your question. I think we've got, uh, so uh, Catherine had her hand first. We'll go to Catherine next. Doctor. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to ask currently what's your practice of initiating um, this type of medication right after cardiac surgery? Uh, because of the fact that, you know, patients are also on Lasix and many other agents that are not part of the usual um, heart failure treatment, which may have an impact on volume status and all that. And the risk of infection is certainly higher at that time than any other time. Um, so what is your current practice? Um, well, thanks for that question, because I, I think that's, um, that's a really important question. And again, it's potentially testable question as well, uh, you know, that as cardiac surgeons, what should you be aware when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitors? And uh, first and foremost, the drug should be uh, withheld for three days prior to major surgery. And why is that? Because there is a chance that these drugs can cause diabetic ketoacidosis. And diabetic ketoacidosis can occur mostly in patients who are insulopenic or patients who are high doses of insulin. That's why we don't use it in type one patients with diabetes. So 
The drugs have to be withheld for three days prior to surgery or two to three days. And there are perioperative papers, some that we've co-authored that I think you should be familiar with as residents uh, as to when to stop it. Now, your question about when to restart it, it should not be restarted on day two or three or, you know, uh, or day one after surgery. It should only be started after PO intake has, sufficient PO intake has commenced, including carbohydrate intake. Um, and that has been the sort of recommendation. So I think day three is appropriate in most of our routine patients to be reinitiated on this therapy. Um, and the other caution is that, uh, you know, if you are, that these drugs, if they do cause decay, it's very, very rare, it can be relatively euglycemic decay. And what do we mean by that is that because the drugs cause you to, uh, you know, pee out sugar, cause glucosuria, it may not present as the overt decay with very high uh, sort of levels of glucose. Um, and that's something that needs to be uh, sort of thought of. Now, I've, I've seen one, one decay in, in my career with these drugs, and uh, we've seen a few surgically as well um, with, with uh, some of my colleagues. So it, it is something that cardiac surgeons need to be aware of. Now, remember that the drugs are indicated in people with or without diabetes, and people without diabetes do not get, they have no risk of decay because they're never going to be insulopenic per se. So that's uh, it's a really important question. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. For the novo, um, the novo initiation of the medication, you use the same cutoff of three days? Uh, yeah. We're not no, no de, de, so de novo, if, if somebody is going for major surgery, uh, it should be two to three days. Uh, so withhold the, the drug for two to three days. And that's major surgery. Somebody's going for colonoscopy. Somebody is acutely unwell. That's the recommendation. Although we did a trial called DARE-19 in COVID-19 patients in hospital, and people thought ooh, that was pretty bold and daring to do that trial. Now, we were underpowered, so we showed safety with, of, of dapagliflozin in COVID-19 patients with a trend towards a benefit, but it did not achieve statistical significance. Thank you. Um, Emma? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Verma. Uh, uh, very quick question. So in terms of the classes um, uh, for SGLT, is there like, based on the patient presentation, whether they're diabetic or, di or not diabetic, should we choose uh, uh, one or SGLT the other? inhibitor, one or the other? No, not, not, not. It's a great question. Really, I think uh, for, uh, for all, all practical purposes and for your purposes, uh, you know, as you're, as you're studying, it's SGLT2 inhibitors. DAPA or EMPA uh, are the two that have been studied in heart failure. Um, and those are the ones that I think are appropriate. Canagliflozin, which is the third one, has not been studied in that population. But I think, you know, as long as you're familiar with one of them and are comfortable with one of them, um, then, and, and you can actually, you know, they're, they're both 10 milligrams are the dose. There's only one dose. There's no up titration of the dose that would be appropriate in that setting. Yeah, most Thank people believe much. it's a class class effect. Okay, thanks. Um, just a follow up question to what you said about you know being more aware of these patients coming in with euglycemic DKA. Um, we've had two patients come in with uh, euglycemic DKA, and we've now got into the habit of any patient of ours who's post op on STLT two inhibitors if they present with feeling unwell or dehydration, we automatically check their beta hydroxybutyrate levels to try and see if we're missing euglycemic DK. Is that kind of what you've been doing in your practice as well, or you would recommend, or how do you suss out this patient's euglycemic DK? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, first of all, it's very rare, right? And it never happens unless there's a stressor in an insulopenic situation, right? So if, you, if you're just cautious about not using it in patients with type 1 diabetes, you know, and not did not, not uh, sort of decreasing the dose of insulin in, too fast in patients who are type 2 diabetics on insulin, then you won't get into that trouble. Uh, now, there's no need for routine sort of measurement of ketones. If patients get DKA, they're pretty sick, right? And then you're, you know, 
then usually what they need at that point in time is, you know, insulin and D5W and, you know, the treatment of D, D, DK, and that usually requires hospitalization. Uh, but routine testing of ketones is not required. Uh, either beta hydroxybutyrate or urinary ketone testing is not required or advocated. Catherine, uh, okay. Catherine has another question if you have a few more minutes. Yeah, sure. I'll take one more question from Catherine, then I'm going to run to the OR. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your uh, train no, of uh, no, no trouble. Train yeah. activity. Uh, just question about maybe sex difference or age difference. Is there any interactions uh, regarding sex or age among patients? Yeah, so really great question. So we, we've, uh, again, published those data. Uh, recently, I didn't show you all of the 30 uh, sub-analyses that we published from DAPA HF, or, you know, but uh, men and women derive similar benefit of empagliflozin and dapagliflozin um, with, with no heterogeneity. And even in HEFPEF, there was no difference. And Javed is presenting those data at the ACC, Dr. Butler, on uh, men and women in the next few weeks. Uh, so there's no sex interaction. And... Uh, the question around age is a really important one uh, because patients are getting older. And in elderly patients with HEFREF, you worry a lot about uh, side effects, right? You worry about renal side effects and you worry about hypovolemia related side effects. So uh, we uh, have actually published that age related uh, paper uh, from DAPA HF. And in about 1,100 patients that were over the age of 75, we found that there was a tenfold lower rate of renal side effects and a sevenfold lower rate, uh, sorry, and no excess in volume related side effects in those in that setting. So very well tolerated in elderly people without any renal toxicity or without any uh, you know, volume related side effects. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, friends, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity. All the best to the trainees on the line for your exams, and um, you, Dr. Verma. look thank forward you. to seeing you in person. Thank you very much, Dr. Verma. Bye. Take care. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks.